Hi everyone, this is Dr. Rose Harden, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about respiratory physiology and continue our discussion on breathing mechanisms and gas exchange. So how do we breathe, right? We have to look at the mechanics of inhalation and exhalation. How are the gases exchanged at the lungs and tissues? Well, we talk about O2 and CO2, right? How, what is the process for this exchange? So let's look at the mechanism of breathing itself. All right, let's begin with the diaphragm. Diaphragm is really important um, when we talk about inhalation and exhalation because the contraction and relaxation assists with both the inhalation and exhalation, as you can see on this picture. So notice first, the diaphragm is going to contract. That's on inhalation. So you can see this contraction and flattening of the diaphragm, which allows the lungs to expand. And then upon exhalation, you see this dome shape. And so the diaphragm is relaxing, right? And this causes decreased area for the lungs and therefore exhalation. The sternum also is involved. When you inhale, the sternum moves more anterior. And when you exhale, the, ster the sternum will move back to its normal position posteriorly. Okay, so these are some additional muscles because every once in a while we deep breathe, um, deep breathing exercises, think of that. So these extra muscles help with inhalation and exhalation. So for inhalation, we have the sternocleidomastoid, we have the scalene muscles, the external intercostals, as well, of course, we can't forget our, our diaphragm. And then Muscles of exhalation include the internal intercostals, the external oblique, those abdominal muscles, as well as the internal oblique, the transversus abdominis, and the rectus abdominis. Almost every abdominal muscle um, participates when you have forced exhalation. Now, the actual process of inhalation and exhalation is all about pressure changes. And you probably remember from maybe a, a previous course um, about atmospheric pressure. And atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters mercury. And we use that to explain pressure changes. Now, that's going to be different when you're high up in a mountain or you're living in Denver, Colorado. But for our purposes, we're going to say 760 as the standard. So at rest, the diaphragm is relaxed. It's in its dome shape right here. Right. Um, the alveolar pressure here is equal. So it's equal to 760 millimeters mercury. Okay, forgive my writing. <laughs> um, next, we have to talk about inhalation. And inhalation, you have a change in alveolar pressure. And that change is brought about by the diaphragm contracting and flattening. So you can see it's like a board there. And what that does is it increases the thoracic cavity space. And that allows for a decrease in pressure. So anytime you have less, something less than atmospheric pressure, the air is going to just simply, you know, think of diffusion. The air is simply going to flow in. Now, exhalation, we have the diaphragm returning to its dome shape. And at that point, right, the thoracic cavity is lessened. And the alveolar alveolar pressure at 607, 662 millimeters mercury, um, that shows and compares to 760, again, 
higher goes to lower, and you have air flowing outward. All right, let's talk about gas exchange. And this part's really cool. All right, so we have a molecule, molecule called hemoglobin, and we know from the previous lectures that hemoglobin carries oxygen from the lungs to the tissues. So here we have the alveoli and alveolar space. And notice the pressure of oxygen is 104 millimeters mercury. Now, the pressure of oxygen in the venous system as it returns um, from the heart to the lungs is around 40. All right, so we have simple diffusion again, right? 104 versus 40, it's going to diffuse out of the alveoli into the blood and attach to the hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells. So that remains at 104, right? Goes through the left side of the heart, right? It's, it can lose some oxygen along the way um, due to any tissues that um, it, it may utilize. But by the time it gets to the tissue levels, right? The tissue is at 40, it's still a 95, and you have outward diffusion of O2 into the tissues. Right? So that depletes the O2 again. So in the venous system, you have a 40 millimeter mercury um, carry or 40 millimeter mercury level of oxygen. And that then goes to the right side of the heart, goes back to the lungs. So that's how the hemoglobin carries O2 from the lungs of the tissue. Again, it's just the pressure differences. Okay, let's talk about CO2 returning back to the lungs to be exhaled. Remember that CO2 is a waste product of metabolism, so it needs to be removed from the tissues and taken back to the lungs to be exhaled. And there's three different ways in which we can, or the CO2 can, um, travel back to the lungs to be exhaled. One of the ways is simple diffusion, and the cellular CO2 diffuses through the endothelial cells into the capillaries. And as you can see, the tissue pressure of CO2 is about 45, and the capillary pressure of CO2 is about 40. So you just have simple diffusion down the gradient. The other way is by carbaminohemoglobin, and that's CO2 that attaches to hemoglobin. Now, CO2, or hemoglobin does not like CO2 as much as it likes O2. So just a few molecules may attach to the hemoglobin, and that's just one way in which CO2 can travel back to the lungs. We also have the, the most common way. And this is the red blood cell will, will, the CO2 will enter the red blood cell and combine with water. Once it combines with water, it forms what's called carbonic acid, and that's H2CO3. And that then dissociates into a hydrogen ion, which often is used and combines with the hemoglobin. But the most important thing is this molecule here that's bicarbonate and co2 and bicarbonate can just diffuse into the blood and co2 is then carried in that manner back to the lungs now at the lungs the co2 the bicarbonate right has to change back into co2 so we just reverse the equation bicarbonate diffuses back into the red blood cell, combines with a hydrogen atom to make carbonic acid, and the result is then, after that, is the carbonic acid dissociates into CO2, H2O, CO2 can go into the alveoli. Um, the hemoglobin, the carbon amino hemoglobin, um, CO2 dissociates, again, back into the alveoli. And then anything that was dissolved in the plasma, the CO2, enters 
the alveolus as well, because remember, we have that pressure differential. And that's it for the presentation today. I hope you have a wonderful day.